Welcome to Talking Books. We're very fortunate to welcome ourselves, one of the country's premier public intellectuals. Robert Sapolsky is the John A. and Cynthia Fry Gunn Professor at Stanford University, where he holds joint appointments in several departments, including neurological sciences. A neuroendocrinologist and a professor of neurology, uh, but he is all at Stanford. He's also a researcher at the National Museums of Kenya. That even those descriptions massively understate his range of interests and fail to account for his national influence in a wide range of disciplines. So his most recent book that we take up today, Determined. <laughs> uh, Aptly illustrates his reach and erudition, I'd say, and determined. Professor Sapolsky takes up a firm position in a long-standing debate over the question of free will. He says that we don't have it, and backs it up with extensive argument and empirical studies. And then the second half of the book goes on to explore the social, cultural, and penal implications of his position, and uh, I, along the way, he layers in literally hundreds of discussions of interesting discoveries or arguments in philosophy, uh, intent, causation, moral responsibility, and the like, that we will not have a hope of covering today. <laughs> Robert Sapolsky, thanks very much for joining us on Talking Books. Good. Thanks for having me on, Harry. Um, am I allowed to say that we last encountered each other around 1978 or so? And thus... You're permitted, except you're stealing the moderator's thunder. Uh, okay. Because I was hoping to start with a bit of personal history. I'm going to claim the right to refer to you as Robert, <laughs> uh, because you were the teaching assistant, and I got to say, a great one in an undergraduate class on biological bases on behavior a mere half century or so ago. <laughs> and your enthusiasm for the then budding field of study was obvious and infectious. So besides saying, you know, I, I uh, referring to this Rip Van Winkle moment, I wanted to ask <laughs> you, you know, how you've been this millennium, as you put it, or just tell us a little, if you don't mind, because my sense, including from talking to you now, is that was a very... Uh, serious intellectual excitement, but there were others. So how you became attracted to the field and decided to, you know, dedicate your life to its study? Well, around the time that we were hanging out in the same classroom, um, right. I was struggling uh, somewhat uh, futilely uh, with the point of whether I was going to be a laboratory neurobiologist or a field primatologist. I decided when I was about 10, I was going to do field primate research, and I was like intensely involved in it. And then in high school, like I got credit for taking a self-taught Swahili ca class because I was going to go to East Africa at some point and all of that. And then, then I stumbled into neuroscience my freshman year at college. And at that point, I was just vacillating between, all right, so was I going to wear hiking shoes every day for the rest <laughs> of my life, or was I going to be like futzing around with test tubes and such? Um, and and Oxford, yeah. <laughs> yes, hopefully, no, well, probably the same hiking shoes. Um, but very fortunately, incredible, like luck and privilege. I've gotten to do both over the years. What I mostly did was maintain a lab looking at the effects of stress on the brain and gene therapy and the nervous system and stuff. Um, but for more than 30 years, I got to skip out each summer and go hang out with a troop of baboons in a national park in East Africa. So I've been oscillating back and forth over all those years, and I'm still not quite clear which which I belong to most. So all right. mostly you probably just... probably weren't out a lot, of, a lot of hiking boots in the interim. And I just want to say... Uh, led to so much work we won't cover. I, in particular, have just recently been introduced to your work on depression and, a, and anxiety. And uh, your it's. Uh, I'll just commend to everyone a determine which were as I say. You know, there's so many nonfiction books. I think that state their thesis, and it's an interesting thesis. And then over the next several hundred pages, restate it six dozen times. Uh, 
it's and you know have kind of let you down a bit. It's not like that. This is so rich, uh, cover to cover, and in a way we're not going to touch on. So please do have a look at it, and um, and then also just your TED talk, many many different aspects of of behavior, you know, from a primate point of view, but not only. Um, well, actually, I'm glad you mentioned depression just now. Um, yeah. Two reasons. One is a lot of my work out with the baboons was showing if you are a low-ranking baboon, right. your brain, your endocrine system is remarkably similar to that of a human with major depression. Uh, so that was a lot of work showing that. So that was kind of an entree into looking at the consequences of that for primates of all sorts. And yeah, there. I mean, there's always, you taught me this back then, just there are pretty strict ranking systems and, and low baboons on the, on the, I guess you wouldn't say totem pole, but low baboons <laughs> in status, they suffer similar, uh, maybe feelings, but certainly um, uh, consequences as low humans on the, on the status scale. There's no, there's no getting away from, you know, the Hobesian world when you're, once you leave <laughs> uh, human society. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let me ask because, um, as I mentioned, a lot of people, uh, you know, back to what Hume or before have talked a lot about free will and have staked out firm positions, including fewer, th I mean, you're in the minority, but have staked out firm positions. It's a big book, a really interesting book. What made you decide to write it? Well, um, mainly because I thought I had already written the book, and it turned out not to be the case. Um, about five, six years ago, I published a book uh, called Behave, the Biology of Humans that Are Best and Worst, which is sort of a bizarrely, yeah. like, still familiar update of that exact class from back when. Um, and it takes you... Melvin Connor, let me just... Tip of the hat to Melvin Connor, who was the teacher at the time. And it was an, actually an anthropology class, weirdly yes. enough. Yes. Though we dissected a brain at the end. Unbelievable. Anyway, go ahead. He was, the, the book is dedicated to him. Um, he's been the single biggest intellectual influence in my life. Um, and wow. I'm still in touch with him and still feel like a nervous idiot when I am and hope <laughs> that I don't stammer too much. Um, but what that book did was look at, okay, a behavior happens. What was going on in the brain a second ago? What was going on with your hormones that morning? What was happening with your neuroplasticity over the previous years? Adolescence, childhood, fetal life, genes, culture, all of that. And I thought that if like you plowed your way through that or managed to sit through a, a one-hour lecture of mine summarizing it, you would come out the other end seeing there's no free will at all, like when you put all those pieces together. And I was struck by the sheer number of people I would hear from who would say instead, wow, when I look at all that science stuff that you were covering, that seems like there's like less free will than we normally think there is. Yeah. So I said, so much for being subtle. Um, right. I need to write a book now that all it does is hammer people over the head over and over about how when you put all those pieces together, I sure don't see a sliver of space for free will in there. So thus, five years later, the, the unsubtle version of the same theme. Got it. Okay, so let's, and let's move to it. So you've, you've said it in brief, but the central argument uh, of the book is that there, in fact, is no, um, no free will. Let's start, Robert, if we could, with vocabulary, um, because there's there's free will we can get to, and our I, I do want to touch on our extru as as your reactions show our extremely strong intuitions to the contrary, which you hold are basically illusory. But let's let I think it's be more useful to get at this from the point of view of the tenet that you hold that that uh, is uh, incompatible with free will, namely that we live in a wholly determinist or deterministic um, world. So let, can I just start with by asking you, what is determinism and uh, how do you, how does it, uh, inf well, let's just start there. What is determinism? Okay. Professor Sapolsky? <laughs> 
Um, well, I, I think probably a good place to start is to show where determinism actually trumps everybody's intuitive sense that they're seeing free will, which is we all find ourselves in a circumstance where we make a choice. We have to make a decision. We form an intent. We act on it. We know we consciously have that intent. Uh, we have a pretty good guess of what the consequence will be. Most importantly, we know we have alternatives. No one's coercing us. And that moment, that momentness feels like so pregnant with agency that for most people and for much of what I understand about like the criminal justice system, uh, that's necessary and sufficient to decide that we're seeing free will and responsibility and culpability in action. And for me, that is totally crazy making because I believe that domain is virtually irrelevant to the free will question. Great, you formed an intent, and the reality is there are multiple options available to you, and you weigh these possibilities, and you reflect on your past, and, your, and you choose, and whoa, that's certainly free will-ish. But the problem is it leaves out the single most important question in there, which is, wow, how did you wind up being the sort of person who would form that intent at that time? And that's where what was happening in your brain a second ago, hormones this morning, back when you were fetus, all of that, you put all those pieces together. And let me just interject in your view before you were a fetus. Yes. Right. You, 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 I mean, if you're going to go turtles all the way down, <laughs> we're, it's a very, very long way. Okay. Sorry, Cult go ahead. Yeah. Culture evolution and some really interesting, uh, sort of versions of that. And you put them all together and, Essentially, what you see is all we are is the sum of our biological luck over which we had no control and its interactions with environment over which we had no control that brought you to that moment of forming that intent. So given that, thus, that's the picture of determinism. And I would say what would constitute determinism in that framework is you do a behavior, you form an intent, you act on it, three and a half neuron, neurons in your brain just did something or other. And the function of that neuron at that moment cannot be understood outside the context of its history. Its history of a second ago, a minute ago, a hundred years ago, all of that. That's what determinism is, that what your brain is doing at any given point is the end product of what everything that came before sculpted it into. And in that framework, you know, you have to define free will as show me a brain that has just done something or other completely free of history, completely free of its past, completely free of how it got wired up during fetal life, what its hormones yesterday were doing to how well neurons were talking to each other, its genes, et cetera, et cetera. Show me a brain that's free of history and you've shown me free will. And you can't show that. Nobody has. Okay. And that's a real, so that's a really nice uh, summary. And I want to return in about 10 minutes or so to this notion that it, in order to show free will, you need to show an ahistorical brain. But let just to stick with it, I you know I think what what we've just laid out, like any you know uh, from anything from you know what you're having for uh, breakfast to whom you ask to marry you, are wildly more complex than the simple view of determinism that nevertheless I think many people would intuitively hold. So you, your book includes studies of unicellular organisms and extremely simple, up to extremely simple human uh, choices of, of pushing a button or not. But, you know, the basic notion that the laws of physics and chemistry sort of dictate where the configuration of the material universe is uh, where it's going to go in the next nanosecond or whatever. I think people are okay with, you know, I've um, a, a somewhat more complicated, but we keep human agency out of it for now. Um, 
paradigm I thought of. You're hitting a, a pool cue. I think most people would agree at the moment you strike it, it either is or isn't the case that the nine's going to go in the right pocket and it <laughs> and it's you know the forces have been put into action. Although then there are many other things that can happen. A, a blunt example would be an earthquake, and that might be a stand-in for your whole notion of moral luck and all the things that that occur. And that would then affect it. But you know the basic notion that where we are you know, and more atoms in the universe uh, it would take to fully describe it, but where we are will dictate where we will be in the, the very next um, neural moment. I think a lot of people would um, get get next to more or less, even though it's, it's fabulously complicated. A, have I described that right? And B, is that a rough and ready sense of determinism? Yeah, one one tiny complication thrown in there as to why there's actually multiple futures at any given point, things that are formally unpredictable, chaoticism, yeah. nonlinearity, all that. But otherwise, yeah, that's the exact picture, which is why I am made crazy by most people who make a living saying that there's free will, which are besides legal people, philosophers, because- I didn't you, realize how personally this <laughs> struck you, actually. So. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. you, you don't get some, you never find a philosopher <laughs> right. who says the world runs on magic and that's why there's free will. Right. What they do is like 99% of them say, yeah, we're made out of material stuff. There's like atoms and there's cells and there's gravity and all those things going on. But somehow, somehow that's still compatible with there being free will, free will compatibilists. And what the surveys yeah. show, 90 to 95% of uh, philosophers, and not to be too snarky here, when they defend their stance and their explanation for how nonetheless free will is compatible, they say, oh, no, 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 we're not just suggesting magic, we're suggesting reasons that are magical. Yeah. And, and we, and I do want, I, I want to push on that and make sure, you know, obviously I'm in no position to rebut or definitively establish anything, but, I, but I'm hoping that people who are listening will understand the, their position and your response. But this, I just want to read, it's very nicely done on page 13. Here is your <laughs> summary of the compatibilist position, um, which we'll get to more, but uh, A, wow, there have been all these cool advances in neuroscience, all reinforcing the conclusion that ours is a deterministic world. B, some of those neuroscience findings challenge our notions of agency, moral responsibility, and deservedness so deeply that one must conclude that there's no free will. C, nah, it still exists. <laughs> so that's your, that's your <laughs> sense of, the, of these um, compatibilists who you've now confessed to all of us just drive you <laughs> to distraction. Um, all right, so but let's bring in the other side. I think we have a sense now of determinism, even though to in any given instance, it's beyond, I think it's decades away from our being able to fully kind of graph anything that's even slightly um, complicated. But you say, well, I was going to go to now, but this is your graduate versus garbage collector. I'll just quickly say that you make the point that uh, you have a sort of anecdote where you're watching someone proudly graduate with a garbage collector in the back and you say, if if that graduate, if all the things that had happened to her or him, and this is all the way down, including before life, had instead occurred to the garbage collector that you would have materially, unavoidably, a switch in positions, which I think if we pushed on it, most people also would agree with. All right, let's go to the other side of things, though. Uh, what it, what it means to what you think it means, or the people mean when they say we have free will? Because so you just you you just did make it seem, Robert, that it necessarily entails some kind of magic, some kind of of uh, unsupported a material, if that's a word, supposition. Um, so is it? 
because you were also talking about things that happen that are psychological or, or have to do with intent, another tricky word that we'll get back to. But is free, is free will, do you believe that free will, as people think of it, means necessarily some uh, occurrence that is without scientific antecedent cause? Is the very concept of free will, as you see it, a um, departure from materialism fully understood? What What's free will? Well, for your average person, none of this stuff needs to be dissected. It's just that intuitive sense. Yeah. And it's one that is really, really powerful in the moment. And in that moment when what I would define is you could choose among options and be a causal agent rather than like exercising free will, but that just feels so... Could have been otherwise kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think for most people, that is just so intuitively powerful. For people who make a living sort of arguing about philosophical aspects of this, um, it's trying to come up with ways in which history doesn't matter, where not only isn't the past not past, the past isn't even relevant. And, you know, this could take a fairly... I think, potentially kind of appalling tone of just looking at what somebody has done without having any interest in how did they wind up being that sort of person. And I think all of us can immediately think of like the way our world works, that just focusing on what somebody has done doesn't give you the remotest sense of like what's really going on there. And when you look at all the ways in which that person became who they are, free will just can't be squeezed in there. And you give some very vivid examples in history that we would now disavow, like uh, schizophrenia or even the treatment of, of witches. But I, I just want to underscore, so I, because I, we've talked, you, you've said some things about free will without uh, at least right here, kind of defining it, but you think it is inherent to the notion of free will as it's used, that it, it involves some departure from materialism or determinism, yeah? yeah? When you force people to really, really analyze what went on, um, and thus, <laughs> like your average person's uh, sort of folk psychology sense of free will yeah. is free will is things I can blame someone for and things I can be praised for. Mm. And By the way, a great important term that you first taught me, folk psychology, which you know is basically <laughs> one sense of how other people are thinking. It's but yeah, sorry, go ahead. It's that that's exactly it. And well, I, some, I, I, you gave me an A. I got an A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you earned it. Congratulations. Um, All right. Thank you. <laughs> and, and what's very interesting is when instead you're praising somebody else and you were being blamed for something. And what we see yeah. is that's when people tend to toss out the, the notion of free will because when it's us who have committed something bad, where rather than something constitutional – that's what I'm like. I've always been that way. I'll always be that way. That's where we come up with something situational that excuse it. You got to understand. I had just done an all nighter. You have to understand. Right. Yeah. And that's a classic sort of thing. I was abused as a child. I mean, you know, p people feel that deeply. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that, that shows some of the folk psychological underpinnings of it um, in that you apply it only selectively and only in certain contexts. And at those times, I mean, essentially it's why I turned out to be wonderful and why I'm allowed to be like infuriated with people in the world around me. Why oh, your mother loves you. Um <laughs> All right, so I think it's time now to take up the term that's come up, uh, compatibilists and incompatibilists, which, among other things, demonstrates this is a long-standing uh, debate. Particular positions have their own uh, special terms. You're a hard incompatibilist. That's not my um, characterization. That's your own characterization within this debate, basically saying... Free will, determinism are not compatible. 
And but the most important there, you can do uh, four schools if you just uh, think about the quadrants here. But the most important alternative school is compatibilists who believe the world is deterministic, just as you said on page 13 of the book. Yeah, it's wow, interesting, but nah, it doesn't exist. But I want to say, and I think you not only don't disagree, it actually kind of motivated the writing of the book, as you put it. Big, big uh, group of very well-known philosophers, legal scholars, um, and very smart people, Daniel Dennett and Robert Kane and Adina Roskies, a uh, tradition dating back at least to Hume. So some pretty uh, smart customers, you know, hold this view. So I don't know if this is a... I, I, in, first, I wanted people to understand what it was, but I think you've already explained it. I don't know if this is a fair or cogent question for you, uh, but just to kind of get at it, of the various compatibilist arguments out there, that you, and you canvas them, which do you think is the strongest? I mean, do, do you, I mean, do you think all of them have at their core this almost silly uh, belief in magic? Or, you know, which do you think is the strongest and which puts most pressure on your position as you see it? Oh, well, that's that's a rude question. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> you know, some of the most interesting yeah. ones out there are the people who basically say, the compatibilists, that, yeah, in this moment, you're just the end product of everything that came before, blah, 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 but you've had free will at some point in the past, or you're going to have it in the future, or it's not in the part of the brain where we're looking, it's in this other part. No, 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 not that part, this other part, this other part. And where they're willing to say that there are very powerful circumstances out of our control that could shape us at times, and where you know their bargaining position is, so these constitute influences. They're not collectively deterministic. And in some ways, this is... You Let me know, just start. But so you mean they they say it has some causal um, not effect that would be too strong, but some causal role, but just not the role that a true deterministic position would hold. That is to say, a a fully um, causal role. Uh, did I if, something like that? Yeah, exactly. Like, and what is it? For example, that happened in the past. Dennett has this heavy emphasis on when we are first growing up, we have opportunities to learn about the world and thus we acquire free will that we could then employ at later points. Robert Kane has this sort of interesting idea that in moments of severe crisis, that's your opportunity to like reinvent yourself with free will. And then that runs you forever after until your next moment of crisis. And all of these are interesting, you know, obviously the process of maturation involves the process of getting far more control over your behavior. Um, in moments of crises, we not only show facets of ourselves, we never knew we were there, but we could be transformed by it, all of that. But still, none of them can sit down and say, here's the nuts and bolts of what's happening at a time when you have a neuron that suddenly doesn't listen to these genes or these hormones or this wiring pattern and instead just gets in its head to do this instead. And that's the problem. I mean, in a sense, you know, God help me for not trying to sound pejorative here, um, but we're kind of getting to sort of a nice liberal stance, which is mm -hmm. to say, you know, there's some people who have a lot less free will than others and there's some occasions where all of us have less free will than normal. And yeah, keep those in mind. Those are the edge cases. You know, if you're trying to evaluate a, a serial murderer who has a history of massive brain damage, yeah, you know, maybe this is a special case. Or if you're trying to, you know, identify someone who in a moment of sheer terror, um, okay, so that was imperfect self-defense, things of that sort. That's 
the special edge cases, a middle general picture of the rest of the time there's free will and there's responsibility. And my argument is, like, you take someone with a history of massive brain damage to a part of the brain, the frontal cortex, that has to do with impulse control and things like that, and you can sit there, and most sensible people, and lots of juries, but not all of them in my experience, can sit there and say, oh, here's what happened to this guy's brain, and that massive injury for it caused this enormous cable of determinism to explain why he did what he did. Okay, so we understand that one. That one we can put in the special case category. And my argument being none of this like edge case special category stuff, but the problem that all of us have is don't look at somebody where had this singular event of the massive brain. Look at all the rest of us. And what's going on instead is a gazillion microscopic little spider webs of things from the past that influence, that played a role in sculpting you into who you are. And that's difficult for two reasons. One is, oh God, you got to slog through a lot of science. And some of that stuff is pretty like obscure stuff. Um, but the second one is it is so hard to accept that you put all those spider webs together and that forms as big of a cable of causality as what went from that guy's brain injury to what he did. It's just super distributed. And we have a lot of trouble with massively distributed causality. It just is hard for that to get added up in our head, let alone synergized all the pieces there. Just a couple quick things. I, I you know, I've asked you a couple times and you, you, uh, why you wrote the book, but I think that's a, that's a theme that comes through as you have particular science, a scientific and b broad Catholic kind of learning that you think brings something to the these arguments that maybe hasn't been brought before. I also just wanted to say there was this is sim, this follows from what you said but there's an, a a pretty nice rebuttal to Dennett where uh Dennett says, you know, all in all luck evens out and and you say, you know, uh wrong the uh the guy who starts out with the brain damage or the uh parent who treats treats him uh, shabbily, et cetera, that guy's bad luck tends to proliferate. And, you know, may maybe you think in a cosmic way, over eons, l luck might even out, but not in terms of anything that, that is important for sort of moral responsibility, which is where we're going. But not quite yet, because I <laughs> want to um, <laughs> um, ask you, well, I want to ask you two things. First, I, I want to push a little bit more uh, on the notion of um, uh, the the compatibilist position, you said things, Robert, over the course of this conversation that make it clear, I believe, that you um, don't disagree that mental states, like intent is the most used word in the book, but also beliefs and desires, those exist, yes? Yeah, and... In the moment, all you know is you have an intent and you don't have to do this. There's alternatives. And thus it just feels you're, you're choosing vanilla over strawberry ice cream and you feel the free will. You're choosing to pull a trigger or not and you feel the free will. And in those moments, yeah, there are indeed multiple possible futures and you were choosing among them, but the choice you wind up making can only be evaluated with what brought you to that moment. And it's- Well, so I see that and, and I am, because I just, I want to get at this very specific point. Okay, but I mean, what if we say that so, but one of the things that bring you to this moment are your particular intents and desires, someone who has different desires and beliefs, is materially different, uh, you know, two people where that are otherwise identical. And why can't we um, say that the overall cause, it, not without giving uh, any, without undermining materialism at all, but that the underlying cause really is beliefs, desires, some kind of choice, and that that position that I act out of my beliefs and desires 
is an expression of what people generally think of as free will. Is that is that a cogent question? Yeah. And sort of the way in which uh, sort of you get out of this is, uh, you know, classic sort of philosophical summary of this and that you see in lots of different forms. Yeah, you could do what you intend, but you can't intend what you intend. You can wish for something, but you can't successfully wish for something different than what you wish for. You can't make yourself believe something different than what you believe. You can't will yourself to have more willpower than you do. And that's where the lack of free will is. Well, is in. it? Because why, why, why can't I say to that, so what? That's right. I would, in fact, I'd be a different person if I had different beliefs. But it's nevertheless the case that the mental... Um, uh, that the beliefs and desires cause me to do what I do, and in that sense, there w w there is free will. Or what what's the uh, what's the the logical gap in that argument? Well, here's here's a great sort of example I experienced recently. Yeah. Um, I was giving a lecture to a bunch of judges, um, and I oh, was uh. laying on them some really interesting studies on yeah. what biology has to do with what decisions judges make. And everybody yeah. squirms uncomfortably. And occasionally uh, yeah. I, I work as a, a teaching witness. And when I'm on the stand and bring this up, I can always hear the, the judge sitting next to me sort of mumbling a little bit um but is this something you do regular i'm just interested on the side i didn't know that that you 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 regularly lecture judges on the federal <laughs> judges <laughs> <laughs> um yeah the other week it was the southern district judges who were having some sort of lunch oh, that's my district yeah, so okay. it was it's incredibly okay. interesting um but i Not went through bad, one yeah. of these where i mean they make this i mean they have views and people yeah. go in the pokey based on them, right? So, yeah, yeah. I was very excited by the opportunity to do this. Um, but this was a group going through, uh, okay, you think you just exercised free will when making that decision? I don't think so. And one of the, one of the judges afterwards said, well, you know, I had this case the other week. And where it was totally obvious to me, the decision I was supposed to make, it was just like textbook clear to me. And that evening, I kind of said, you know, maybe there's something a little bit different in this case. And I went back and read the details and I thought about this guy and I realized, no, I'm actually going to make a different decision on this one. Wasn't I showing free will? Free, yeah, and uh -huh. to which I said, no, not in the slightest. How do you turn out to be somebody who would still think about that case in the evening? How do you turn out to be somebody who had enough respect for your uh, introspection and reflection to come up with a different conclusion? How do you wind up having the self-confidence that you wouldn't sit there and say, oh, no, I'm not willing to admit I was wrong even for three months? How do you wind up being that person where that's what you did that evening? You didn't decide to have that much confidence and thus be willing to admit you. You didn't decide, I'm going to respect reflection. How did, yeah, that's not by chance that you wound up being that person. All right. And that, or that's a great uh, example. And I would just, uh, you know, uh, drop a footnote to say, okay. And uh, so that might be a, a way of acknowledging uh, that it was completely determined in a sense, but at the same time uh, determined by things that we, at least in folk psychology, think constitute free will, that is, by beliefs, desires, and the like. In fact, uh, given this, this is where I thought we'd move to next, because you said repeatedly, you say yourself <laughs> in the book, even I think I'm crazy sometimes <laughs> when I think about this. And what that, I think, underscores is we have very strong intuitions that are contrary to your um, view. Although you mentioned, interestingly, you know, you developed that view. You must have been a very interesting 10-year-old. <laughs> um, but um, let, me let me ask, why do you think that is so? From an evolutionary perspective or just, you know, uh, any kind of functional perspective, why do humans have such a very strong 
intuition that 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 they act according to free will what purpose does that uh serve how did it come to be if you think it's so you know self-evidently mistaken well because the alternative to believing in free will is potentially a total bummer a total depressing opening up of this existential void you know mm-hmm. Uh, every organism out there, their heart is going to stop beating if they have a heart. We're the only ones who know it. Every single organism out there is a biological machine, us included. We're the only ones who could recognize our machineness and even understand there's buttons and levers and that's who I am. And that's really a drag. I mean, sort of arguments about, oh my God, you can't get people to stop believing in free will. They're just going to run amok. Yeah, that's like interesting little policy sort of icing to put on the whole question. The much deeper one is, oh my God, who am I? How did this happen? Where did I, what does any of this mean? And all sorts of interesting work has been done and sort of evolutionary psychology, a name you heard in that class way back when this guy, Robert Trivers, who's one of the pioneers of sociobiology, um, he got very interested in this notion that if you're going to evolve into being a primate who's smart enough to know that everyone who you love is going to die someday, that you were going to die, that all of these, if you're smart enough, to, you had better have evolved an astonishing capacity for self-deception. And like basically the Otherwise only way- Otherwise you just sit at home and never reproduce, sort of, that's the notion? Or just throw yourself <laughs> off a cliff or- <laughs> But yeah, like the, okay. the capacity for denial and rationalization and self-deception is essential for, in a sense, the psychological well-being of a species that's smart enough to know what reality is. And in that regard, I love this definition of depression. Depression is a pathological inability to rationalize away reality. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's like the psychological idea that, that, that treatment uh, takes you from neurotic unhappiness to normal <laughs> unhappiness or whatever. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. All right, but let me ask, because that's not what I at least took from, uh, I think it's Anthropology 164. Oh, my as a, God. I mean, that's a pretty exotic evolutionary argument. I see it. Do you, is that, is that the, because it's a, an important thing staring you in the face. There's very strong intuition. So is that, I, I see Trivers' argument. Is that what you buy? I mean, that's your actual, you know, best guess as to why our, our intuitions are so contrary to what you think is factual? Well, yeah. Um, and I think that tells us about the ubiquity of religion as in a rational set of explanations for the unexplainable mm-hmm. and the terrifying in life. Um, it makes perfect sense. We're, we're a species that's very good at fooling ourselves about things that are very, very unsettling otherwise. You know, that's really interesting. And I'm, this is a, it's not exactly in the book, but I, you know, I do think like for all the discrediting we now that has occurred of, say, Freud and others, this one point, and there's a lot of really interesting new learning from Kahneman and others, this one point that, like, we fool ourselves a lot, and we really don't, the, the thing that really survives is we can be really wrong about what we believe or think. It's a, that's, a, I think, a dominant theme now in psychology. That you know, there's reasons why we 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 get it wrong all the time, including our memory of what was, yep. what we liked or not. That's super interesting. Yeah, and I maybe th- that's the new cutting edge field that somebody at Harvard will go into thirty years from <laughs> you know for the next thirty years. Um, all right, I just want to tell you, we only have a few minutes. It's been a fantastic discussion, Robert. Thank you so much. But we, we I want to at least spend a few minutes on the second half of the book. Because you could say that your view, fully accepted, would lead to a kind of, you know, complete um, uh, morality run amok. Why punish anybody? Everyone's, um, you know, blameless in the sense that it, 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 it were caused, but it wasn't what. 
the paradigm of you made this free will choice that that really um, supports almost all of the criminal law you think is deeply flawed. Um, so the obvious question would be why haven't, if, if accepted, and maybe your argument is, but don't listen to what I'm saying when you do the <laughs> criminal law. But I don't think that'd be your, your uh, answer. So why is it that the position, if fully taken aboard, uh, wouldn't in fact lead to, uh, you know, a terrible anarchy, uh, crime, absence of all moral responsibility or what, what a sense of moral responsibility uh, affords society? Well, on the like experimental science end, there's actually a literature that suggests that if you don't believe in free will, you don't run amok. You are just as ethical in your behavior as someone who mm -hmm. thinks we should be held very closely responsible for our actions. Um, and it's remarkably similar to the literature, that extensive one, showing why atheists don't run amok. Atheists, mm -hmm. people who are atheists out of very strongly held beliefs, rather than just this sort of apathetic whatever, are as highly, highly ethical in their behavior as are people who strongly are religious. And Okay, so that's kind of floating on So that that's very road. fair, but of course our focus is on the people who, who, who do antisocial behavior and our, our system for, or the rationalization of our, of our, of our penal system. Yeah, and... You're absolutely right, and this is where people listening to this are going to fling down their headphones or whatever and say this guy uh, is like... Hey, if they've made it 52 minutes, <laughs> we've done great. <laughs> well, I mean, if you really, really, really do believe this stuff, which I do occasionally, um, blame and punishment are intellectually and ethically unacceptable. Yeah. Praise and reward are unacceptable. Anyone being entitled to anything, deserving anything, having earned anything is unacceptable. And like what that does is criminal justice makes no sense. Parentheses, meritocracies make no sense either. And that's a whole separate problem. Oh my God. It's, so are we just got to have murderers running around in the streets. Obviously that not. That would be the question. Yeah. We have means of protecting society from dangerous things without judgment. You get a car its brakes don't work. If you drive it, it is going to be a disaster. And what you do is you put the car in a garage, but you don't moralize at it. You don't go in there every morning with a sledgehammer and smash it over the hood because of how rotten its soul is. Um, you contain it. Oh my God, that's so mechanistic, turning us into being just machines. Just that, that's so dehumanizing, much better being dehumanizing rather than sermonizing us into having bad souls. But still, this seems so implausible. But yeah, all the time we are capable of protecting society from dangerous individuals without invoking free will. And we do it so readily, we don't even see that we're doing it. Your kid is sneezing a lot and you keep them home from kindergarten tomorrow because they have that sign saying, you know, if your child has a cold, please keep them home so you don't get everyone sick. You keep your, ooh, you do pre-crime intervention. You quarantine your kid. You constrain their behavior, but not an inch more than what's absolutely necessary. You don't keep your kid home and say, ooh, you can't play with your toys today because you've done this rotten thing with your runny nose. And you put effort into understanding the root causes of runny noses in five-year-olds. It's a classic public health quarantine model. And that seems like so absurdly like utopian. Where and we've done it so regularly that we don't even know that we do it. If you and I were sitting around like four centuries ago, it would have seemed intuitively obvious that terrible weather that comes from out of nowhere is caused by witches. They have the free will to control the weather. And now 400 years later, we figured out, ooh, there's no free will involved in people being able to control the weather. And it's like a much better world that we don't burn old ladies at the stake anymore when the weather turns bad. It's a much better thing that we realize that kids who have trouble learning to read are not lazy and unmotivated and maybe not that smart, but there can be little architectural abnormalities in one part of their cortex 
and they flip looped letters around and they have dyslexia. It's a much better world because we don't raise those individuals being taught that they are lazy and unmotivated. It's become a more humane place. And fortunately, say in that realm, that's become normal enough that it seems like, oh yeah, obviously, you don't tell the kid with dyslexia that they're stupid and, and unmotivated. There's different teaching techniques. Oh, you don't believe in free will. You've subtracted that out and making sense of kids who keep misspelling words that have B's and P's in them and confuse the two. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's just like our normal contemporary educational sort of progressive. What you've done there is you realize there's no free will in that domain and you figured out how to run things. You know, an airline pilot has hay fever and they're taking antihistamines and through no fault of their own, don't fly for the next three days. You have drug resistant epileptic seizures and through no fault of your own, you got to be this many months seizure free before you can drive a car again. In all these cases, we've taken free will out of the question. We've protected society against sort of endangering things. We've done it without moralizing. We don't constrain people one step inch more than we need to, to do the absolute minimum. And we like make sure there's some people out there who are working very hard to figure out what the root causes are. Ooh, how can we make an antihistamine that doesn't make you drowsy? Or, ooh, how can we prevent learning differences in the brain that are formed with, during fetal life or whatever? We do it all the time. It's just that in the domains where, domains where we don't do it now, where we still see free will, like it just intuitively makes sense that somebody has shown some volition. And just try to think, you know, rather than 400 years from now, when you and I were kids, the explanation for kids who weren't learning how to read was a free will laden one. And now it's intuitively obvious that that's not what's going on. Just think you got to keep doing it again and again, because 10, 20 years from now, with any luck, it will seem intuitively obvious that domains that we see dripping with blame or praise right now, oh, Turns out that's not another one of them. We just have to keep pushing at this. You go through the the sort of historical scenario of, of autism and the terrible time that mothers had when we, you know, were when it was generally ascribed somehow to their not being loving. Um, I feel I can add. He, we're at the very end of our discussion, and I feel like I can actually add a fillip of knowledge from my own uh, background here because. Um, I, I think this is your your point of view is less of a revolution uh, in thinking than you may uh, believe because you know there are four commonly proffered justifications for punishment. Uh, they are at in some uh, tension with one another. But to me, one of maybe the strongest, so there's general deterrence, specific deterrence, retribution. Uh, which is the most kind of, I think, contrary to what you're saying. But there's incapacitation. And uh, there are, I think, uh, certain folks who it's a fact that uh, between the ages of 21 and 35, they'll be in jail or committing serious crimes. That's a fact. And if and one of the justifications that are, are, are proffered is, you know, you just want them isolated for that time, etc. That that strikes me as fairly similar to the notion we're, you're talking about now of doing the, the, the minimum up to protect society without bringing, you know, uh, uh, notions of blame and moral responsibility to it. All right, as I said, this is the second half of the book and a whole nother hour, which we <laughs> do not have. But man, has this been an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, um, Robert Spolsky, for talking about Determined with us and for uh, our 50-year our, um, or so uh, <laughs> reunion. Well, so uh, uh, really, very much appreciate your being here. Good. Well, thanks for having me on, Harry. And it's always nice to see that someone who was in any form a student of mine somewhere in the past is now gainfully employed. So that's a good <laughs> uh, thing. It's all a bunch, but as you know, it's all a bunch of luck. So, anyway. <laughs> good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. 
Talk to you later.